Uh, wow. Thank you guys. I mean, I know I've been doing this for a while now and everything, but it is truly humbling to reach this kind of milestone. So a very belated but earnest thank you. I've been wanting to make this video for a while now, so this seems like the perfect opportunity. How about we take a look at the power of three? What worked in this arc, what didn't, and how would I rewrite it if given the chance? This is going to be the spiritual successor to my rewriting the new prophecy video in a video I wanted to make for quite a while. So strap in and let's do this. Let's rewrite the power of three. Now, before I can even begin to explain how I would rewrite this particular arc, we've got to talk about the Power of Three arc as a whole for a bit. This might be surprising, but I actually have a lot of nostalgia for this arc in particular, even if these books haven't aged particularly well in my opinion. These books were coming out at the height of my own warrior's obsession back in junior high, and I was just really, really into the mystery of this arc. I loved Jay Feather, Lion Blaze, and Holly Leaf a lot, and I was so excited for each new book that came out that I would beg to be driven to the bookstore the day it came out, and I would stay up all night reading it so that I could talk to my friends and the internet in general about the book the next day. I was so excited for any little hints at the greater story that I didn't even care that the book seemed to be moving super, super slowly. Just ever so slowly. <laughs> oh, but it had to be leading up to something really, really awesome, right? There's just so much weight put on the prophecy, and there's all this intrigue with the ancient tribe cats and soul, and... and... Uh... <laughs> okay. I won't lie, I was actually still pretty on board, even after Sunrise came out and it turned out to be a bit of a disappointing ending, but my enthusiasm did eventually die midway through Omen of the Stars. And to Omen of the Stars credit, I don't think it's fair that Omen of the Stars often gets the most hate and is the point that most people stopped reading the books, because I really think that Power of Three just exhausted people. Many, including myself, have a lot of nostalgia for it, but it's overall the weakest arc when I put aside my fond memories of it. Especially after I eventually did finish reading Omen of the Stars, Power of Three just gets worse in hindsight. That's not to say that Omen of the Stars doesn't have its own fair share of issues, it definitely does, but Power of Three really set up that disappointment by hyping up the prophecy book after book only to completely abandon its narrative in the last two books for something only tangentially related. Ask most Warriors fans to tell you the important plot beats of The Sight, Outcast, Eclipse, or even Long Shadows, and other than the most important chapters, can they even remember anything else that happened? And then it just becomes increasingly clear in Omen of the Stars that the narrative didn't really have any satisfying answers to our questions, and I think that's what really lost people. Had Omen of the Stars not been piggybacking off of the Power of Three with the same story, most of the same characters, and the same pacing issues, Omen of the Stars wouldn't have been such a slog to get through. And I don't want to say that the Power of Three is bad for going off on a tangent either in the last two books. On the contrary, I think that Long Shadows and Sunrise are easily the most memorable books from the arc. Just the story bits from these two books have fueled more animation maps than I think any other part of the Warrior series, so it's definitely got that going for it. But I also don't think that it's controversial to say that most people recognize that there's just something not right with The Power of Three. Every book goes on and on without saying much, giving only scraps of new developments and hints that things are about to get good, we promise. And I'm sorry, we're gonna pick on Outcast here for a little bit. Can you even tell me what happened in this book? What is this book doing here? What does it have to do with anything? Storm for who? What are you guys doing here? Tribe, get lost. Besides the dullness of the first four and a half books, the fire scene with Ashfur and Hollyleaf's subsequent breakdown is thrilling. But it never really scratches that itch that it set out to scratch, you know? We have this huge, life-changing prophecy of doom and promise to power, 
And then the arc wraps up with no catastrophic war or power struggle. It ends with interpersonal conflict and the death of one of our leads. Which again, is not bad. I love this conflict and Holly Leaf's downfall. It just doesn't have much to do with the main storyline. A lot of speculation floats around about how these two arcs were written. Power of Three and Omen of Stars, that is. Most of us agree that it seems that they were written without a strong idea of where they would end. And if it turns out we're right about the production of this particular arc in particular, and if it turns out we're right about that, it's safe to say that a lot of these problems come from the main writing team not truly knowing where this arc was going from start to finish. We do know that even the three's powers weren't decided from the get-go, and the only real thread connecting everything was that fire scene. Vicky has said that the scene inspired the whole arc. She didn't even know who or why the scene was happening at first, but the pieces of the puzzle just slid into place. Which is so fascinating to me because the foreshadowing about the three's true parentage and Ashfur's scheming is truly the standout stuff from this arc. No questions asked. It has setup, plenty of clever foreshadowing, and the payoff is legendary. It's just everything around it that's kind of, well, it leaves a lot to be desired. If the Three's powers weren't decided until the first Book of Omen of the Stars, that means that everything connected to the prophecy and powers didn't have anywhere to go for a whole six books. There isn't that same foreshadowing and consideration given to the main plot as the B plot. It also means that the authors had no idea how the powers were meant to tie into the final battle as well, and by the time they got there, it was a little too late to integrate it in a meaningful way. And the powers playing second fiddle to family drama isn't all bad either. I love the family drama. I want more interpersonal conflicts in my Warriors books. But even that only gets so good because of the ripple effect this drama has on character motivations. You have to kind of make some big leaps in logic to really make this all work. And some of the characters, like Hollyleaf, for example, have a pretty sudden shift in character for the sake of keeping the plot moving. Which also brings us around to the problem of character agency. So for an example, Ashford tries to kill Jay, Feather, Hollyleaf, and Lionblaze. Not because they're in a prophecy and they're special or anything like that, or because Ashfur has a personal vendetta against them in particular, but because it would hurt Squirrel Flight. This is a conflict that doesn't really involve our leads. They had no choice over the actions that put them in this position. And this is how conflict works in every single one of these books, except for the last one where Hollyleaf takes an active role in the story, and she only does this after learning that she shouldn't be a part of it. For characters who were supposed to have the power of the stars in their paws, they really have very little power over any situation that they are put into. Considering what the prophecy is and how devastating it's promised to be, you would assume that these characters would be protagonists that are forces of nature in and of themselves, and other characters just kind of have to live in the whirlwind that they create around them, instead of the opposite. Jayfeather, Hollyleaf, and Lionblaze are constantly swept up in the tide of previous characters' actions and either reacting to or dealing with those outcomes. So that's a lot of my big negatives. However, I do want to say there are still a lot of things that I love about this arc. Like I said before, I love Jayfeather, Lionblaze, and Hollyleaf. Especially the potential each one of them had to be dynamic characters. I love the mystery and intrigue around the prophecy. I love that we get three characters' perspectives each book. It makes the three feel like a unit. I love seeing Jayfeather, Hollyleaf, and Lionblaze grow up and the more day-to-day -day squabbles inside ThunderClan which felt appropriate since we were still getting used to the Lake Territories as a whole. And it was fun to have a group of protagonists that never even knew the Old Forest to begin with, and so they were experiencing all these new things in this new territory as well. The apprentices that grew up with our three here are, at least in my eyes, some of the last ThunderClan cats that actually get some proper development. You know, at least from the background character department. There was a lot more rivalry between apprentices here, and not just in ThunderClan, but in other clans too. We get Breezepelt and Heathertail in this arc. We also get introduced to Tigerheart, Dawnpelt, and Flametail as kits. I like all of these characters. 
There's some cool follow-ups with the new Prophecy characters too, like Crowfeather, Squirrelflight, Brambleclaw, Leafpool, and Mothwing, but they don't overshadow the new characters most of the time. It's a good balance. So yeah, there's some pros and cons out of the way. As you can see, I'm pretty conflicted about this arc. And as a result, I'm conflicted with how I would go about rewriting it as well. This is going to be a long video because I have a lot more problems that need fixing in this arc than I did in my new prophecy video. And if you remember, my main thesis for that video was that the problem wasn't the story, the problem was the way it was written. By just changing whose perspective we saw the story through, it changed how attached to the characters you became. I have the opposite problem here though. My problems all stem from the story, but not the way it was told. So that gives me a whole different conundrum. Cause it's easy to come in here and be like, well, let's just scrap everything and let me tell you the story I would have done instead. I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. I want a satisfying way to make this story work or at least something as close to this story as I can get. So after a lot of deliberating, brainstorming, and finally coming to the conclusion that in order to rewrite the power of three into something that I would find satisfying, I had to break a few canonical eggs. So since that's the case, here's the rules I gave myself. We are keeping the three's POV in each book. So we've got to find a way for each character to grow and be important in each title. None of this five chapters where Lion Blaze does absolutely nothing in the whole of Night Whisper shenanigans. Ugh. Like last time, I'm going to be adding my own characterizations to help flesh out the narrative. We're going to keep things as canonical as possible while also allowing events to be shuffled around a bit between Omen of the Stars and the Power of Three. Since these two arcs are so closely knit, this shouldn't cause too much of a problem. And for those of you wondering, yes, I'm planning a follow-up video for Omen of the Stars, eventually. One of my biggest problems with The Power of Three is the slow pace. So things are going to move a lot quicker in this rewrite, which also means there's inevitably going to be some cuts and additions I make to the narrative in order to help escalate conflict and all that jazz. Okay, with the rules out of the way, here are the five key problems I have with the story that I want to address in my rewrite. Number one, the ableism surrounding Jay Feather's medicine cat position. Yeah. Number two, Lion Blaze. The boy is boring. This will not do. He's supposed to be another Brambleclaw-esque character who could turn into a fighty McFighterson bloodbath, so let's play with that. His power is also super OP, so we've got to find a good use for it. Number three, Holly leaves sudden heel turn to warrior code crazy town and equally sudden death. Number four, soul. Enough said. Number five, giving the prophecy and power some meaning even in this arc. This also includes other background stuff like giving rock a purpose, the ancient tribe cats, and yeah, the lore, it's a bit of a mess. So with these guidelines in place, let's start at the beginning with the site. A quick refresher for those who don't remember what happened in this book. I won't be doing a summary for every single book because things start changing drastically, but this is probably the one that's going to have the most similarities. So quick refresher. Holly, Jay, and Lion are apprentice. Jay Paw wants to be a warrior and is given Brightheart as his mentor. Lion Paw gets Ashfur as his mentor, and Holly Paw wants to be a medicine cat and trains with Leafpool. Jay Paw and Holly Paw eventually switch because Jay Paw is basically forced to be a medicine cat by Star Clan, and Holly Paw sucks at it. Gray Stripe returns along with his new mate Millie. This causes a brief bit of drama where Thunder Clan isn't sure who should be deputy. Gray Stripe, who was the deputy before he was presumed dead and lost forever, or Brambleclaw. I am out, these are both terrible options. Firestar eventually decides to keep Brambleclaw as his deputy. The clans hold an all-day gathering in order to celebrate the way they've come together since the Great Journey, and the apprentices participate in some good old-fashioned friendly competition. Near the end of this gathering, Breeze Paw gets trapped into a sinkhole, and Jay Paw, Lion Paw, and Crowfeather save him. That's the basic gist of things. If you want a more in-depth summary, I recommend watching Moon Kitty's I Spoil videos for this arc. I did before writing this script, and it was a godsend. Thank you, Moon. Okay, so 
Here's what I change. A quick warning, we're going to be talking about ableism here for a hot minute, so please prepare yourself for Essentially, I'm going to rewrite this book so that ThunderClan has to tackle their ableism head on and see what that looks like. I hope I do this justice, but I'm always willing to listen to feedback on this part. This is based on my own rather limited experience and what I've heard from other people in the community. J. Kit's blindness and the way that his story plays out in this book is the topic of a lot of back and forth. On one hand, the reveal of J. Kit's disability and his passion to prove himself is palpable. J. Paw became an instant fan favorite with the release of this book. His story is relatable and you really root for him. So that's why it really, really sucks that despite his best efforts, J. Paw is forced to become a medicine cat. And not only does this suck for J-Paw, but it continues this not-so-great trend of putting disabled characters in the medicine den as though being a cat doctor is somehow more suitable for them. Mini rant time. I don't buy this idea that somehow being a medicine cat is easier than being a warrior, therefore more suitable for disabled characters to do. With proper thought put into it, there's no reason J-Paw shouldn't have been allowed to become a warrior if he wanted, or any other disabled cat for that matter. And yes, this includes Cinderpelt. 90% of a warrior's duties are just going out on patrols and hunting. And a three-legged or a blind cat wouldn't have that many difficulties here. Ask anyone with a three-legged or blind cat, especially if that cat was born blind. They usually get around just fine and could defend themselves as well. Some considerations for their disabilities would have to be taken, yes. And they might be a bit more of a risk in battle, or they might need to retire early. And if they wanted to be a medicine cat at the end of the day, that's fine too, of course. But just forcing it on them is just such small brain thinking, plain and simple. And it just seems to romanticize the idea of quote-unquote broken people being able to heal able-bodied people. Ugh. So in my rewrite, instead of wanting to be a warrior, J. Kit is just really trying to find a way to be an active member of the clan. Because the clan has basically decided to keep him as a Kit longer than Holly and Lion, with the implication that he'll be moved to the Elder's Den eventually and never even be given the opportunity to train. Holly Paw and Lion Paw get apprenticed while J. Kit stays in the nursery. Some clan cats, like Thornclaw and Spiderleg, resent J. Kit and say things like, he's using up valuable resources, he doesn't contribute anything to ThunderClan, which is horrible, but on the other side of things, Firestar and his family say that J. Kit is part of the clan just like any other cat, but they won't allow him to do anything, even though he wants to. In the midst of all this, Brightheart stands up for J. Kit and begins training him privately. After a while, J. Kit realizes he wants to become a medicine cat, and Brightheart helps him learn the territory and uses her past medicine cat training to show J. Kit how to care for herbs so that he can prove his worth to Firestar and Leafpool for the position. Even at the beginning, J. Kit's powers are starting to emerge. He can feel the emotions of his clan and how they resent and pity him, and this makes him bitter and gives him all of his angst that we know and love him for. StarClan visits J. Kit one night in his dreams and encourages J. Kit to continue pursuing to become a medicine cat. StarClan tells J. Kit that it's important he keeps faith in them. They allude to his powers being something that, without their help, could destroy him. Ominous. Woo. Now, during all this, of course, Hollypaw is training with Leafpool to be a medicine cat. For the time being, this mostly stays the same as the book with a slight addition that when she is a medicine cat apprentice, she feels ostracized from the other ThunderClan apprentices. She doesn't get their in-jokes and feels like she's being left behind. This builds up as time goes on and she gets more frustrated with medicine cat duties. It's not bringing her the glory recognition or satisfaction she thought it would. For Lionpaw, I want to focus more on the apprentice dynamics and give Lionpaw a bit more character development. Reminder, the apprentices around this time are Berrypaw, Hazelpaw, Mousepaw, Cinderpaw, Honeypaw, and Poppypaw. The other apprentices are jealous of Lionpaw for picking things up so quickly. And because Lionpaw isn't very humble about his prowess either, they pretty quickly start to exclude Lionpaw and call him a show-off. 
Ashfur also turns out to be a hard mentor to please. Two guesses as to why, and the second guess doesn't count. With no real friends and no Holly Potter J kit to hang around either, he begins training in the Dark Forest. Tigerstar and Hawkfrost feed into Lionpaw's ego, and in a way, are the closest things to friends that Lionpaw has made so far. As much as Lionpaw loves being better than everyone else at fighting, he does feel guilty for talking to Tigerstar and Hawkfrost, who he, of course, knows are bad. Lionpaw is going to start off as a big brat and pretty punchable, cocky, better than you attitude, and a tendency towards bullying. I want readers to be like, I would never wish harm on a child, but someone please punt this little twerp into the lake. Entitled rude boy who thinks he's hot stuff because of his skills and his daddy is ThunderClan's deputy. This will make sense later. At Lionpaw's peak obnoxiousness, he tries to talk to Holly and Jay about his problems, but both are kind of bitter towards him as well. Holly Paw wants to be better friends with the other apprentices, so she doesn't understand why Lion Paw can't just get over himself and be nice. And while Jay Kit understands the struggle of not getting along with their clanmates, he's still bitter about not becoming an apprentice at all, and thinks that Lion Paw has it pretty easy compared to him. Jay Kit's powers also allow him to read Lion Paw's emotions, and Jay Kit is taken aback by what he finds. Unlike most of ThunderClan cats, who J. Kit mostly feels pity from, J. Kit realizes that Lionpaw doesn't really have any feelings towards him whatsoever, only apathy. <sighs> so, the kids are all being crap to each other and going through a time. My changes here are all done in the hopes of really putting our protagonists through some tough character development right off the bat, but also hopefully foreshadow their roles for the rest of the series. Each character is going to go through their own problems with self-worth and handling it in a different way. Jay, Holly, and Lion start off as ambitious but loving siblings to each other, but then things pretty quickly become complicated and messy, putting a strain on their relationship as each becomes more burdened with their own problems. They forget to care about each other. And while Lionpaw starts off pretty unlikable, readers will have Hollypaw and, in particular, Jay Kit to root for. As we get to the back half of the book, Graystripe and Millie arrive. Only this time, instead of showing up at a gathering, Graystripe and Millie show up during a border patrol Lionpaw is on. Lionpaw is the first to notice the different scent and charges in after the intruders, attacking them without hesitation, just like Tigerstar and Hawkfrost showed him how to do. Lionpaw's clanmates are horrified that he attacked Graystripe, and this begins Lionpaw's wake-up call that he's been too brash and big-headed. He begins to realize that the other apprentices were right about him, and his ego is shattered. Even Brambleclaw scolds Lionpaw pretty harshly and tells Lionpaw that he's extremely disappointed in him, not just for attacking Graystripe, but for his general attitude. As ThunderClan debates on how Graystripe and Millie are going to fit back into clan life, this parallels Hollypaw and Jay Kit's problems as well. Through watching Graystripe reintegrate, Hollypaw realizes that she'd be happier training as a warrior. And when Millie becomes part of the clan, this gives Jay Kit the courage he needs to tell Firestar and Leafpool that he wants to become a medicine cat apprentice and he can prove he's capable of doing it. After all, if a former kitty pet can walk into camp and become a warrior, why shouldn't he get a chance? Though he can feel his clanmates doubt and pity him again, J. Kit also feels Brightheart's pride and confidence in him. J. Kit's nerves do get the best of him a few times and he makes a few unfortunate mistakes, but overall does the job. Firestar questions how J. Kit learned all of this and instead of outing Brightheart, he tells Firestar and Leafpool that a Star Clan warrior taught him everything. This half-truth seals the deal and J. Kit finally becomes J. Paw, Leafpool's apprentice. J-Paw feels strange, unfamiliar emotions from Leafpool, and Firestar is also strangely hesitant towards J-Paw's apprenticeship. J-Paw doesn't know what to make of these emotions other than assuming that they still don't believe he can do it. He burns with anger, but also determination to prove them wrong about him. As we reach the climax of this book, the clans still go to the all-day gathering, but this time J-Paw, Lionpaw, and Hollypaw are enjoying the gathering together. Before the gathering begins, the siblings have a heart-to-heart -heart where they each apologize for not being there for each other. Jay Paw finally feels like he's where he belongs and is peers once again with his siblings. 
He confesses that Brightheart was the one who helped him learn everything. And while Lionpaw has recovered a bit from his shame of attacking Graystripe, he's still a bit withdrawn. But Hollypaw and Jaypaw are just happy to have gotten an apology from their meat-headed brother. Another thing to note is that throughout this book, we would still get introduced to Breezepaw and Heatherpaw. Lionpaw in particular has had a few confrontations with Breezepaw. At the end, Breezepaw still nearly dies until Jaypaw feels his distress through his power, and he, Lionpaw, and Hollypaw go save him. Teamwork! Yay! The clans celebrate Jaypaw, Lionpaw, and Hollypaw's heroics, and things end on a nice little note about finding out where you belong, teamwork, and communication. Yay! Only now we get the epilogue. Ah, <laughs> that's right. There's no prologue to the series, only epilogues. Firestar is receiving a dream from Star Clan. Instead of any particular Star Clan cat visiting Firestar, he can only explore a hostile and dark forest. And the words of a thousand ancestors cry out, "Beware! Three will come, kin of your kin, who hold the power of the stars in their paws." Firestar wakes up in a cold sweat as he hears commotion outside his den. We as the readers now realize that this took place several moons ago as Firestar sees Leafpool and Squirrelflight walk into camp with Jaykit, Hollykit, and Lionkit as newborns, and Firestar looks on with uncertainty. Okay, that was a lot of setup and some definite changes, but I'm hoping that all of this will strengthen the narrative and characterization and give us some juicy foreshadowing of things to come. Next, we move on to Dark River, or as I'm going to call it, Dark Passage. This title changes for multiple reasons. One, I think the tunnels play a larger role in the story than the river itself. Two, in my version of events, a lot of the flooding river stuff is going to be removed entirely. Sorry, fallen leaves. And number three, Passage has multiple connotations. So while the title is literally talking about the dark tunnels under the clans, it's also about Jay Paw, Lion Paw, and Holly Paw growing up and the Dark Passage could imply a harsh period of time for the trio that they need to pass through. So, it's been a few moons since the end of the site. Jay Paw is doing well in his medicine cat training, Holly Paw has caught up to the other apprentices, and Lion Paw is no longer an egotistic show-off. However, Lion Paw still hasn't managed to make any friends, and is still training in the Dark Forest. Lion Paw wants to be a better person, but he doesn't know where to start and feels like he's messed things up too badly with the other apprentices. Ashfur is still as impossible to please as ever, and the only way Lion Paw feels good about himself and his abilities is with Tiger Star in the Dark Forest, even though he can't help think of what happened with Greystripe and the guilt that comes with that. One night, Lion Paw sneaks out of camp to clear his head and ends up running into Heather Paw. They start hanging out with each other as an escape from their problems. He finds out that she's been having similar problems in Wind Clan with making friends and living up to her clanmates' expectations of her. They hit it off and agree to meet up at night in the tunnels that Heatherpaw has found under the clans. Now that she's caught up in training, Hollypaw is becoming extremely popular with the other apprentices and really is sort of the leader of the pack. Hollypaw is delighted to be looked up to so fondly by all of her clanmates and tries to use her authority for good. She solves minor disputes and gets praised by the older warriors for her calm reason and maturity. And finally, we have Jaypaw, who finds the stick and learns about the cats that used to live around the lake and their history. He experiences the whole Jay's wing history up to the cats leaving for the mountains and them becoming the tribe. He also learns about the tunnels under ThunderClan and WingClan territory and how they used to be used as a rite of passage for the ancient cats. Instead of cats drowning down there, though, some would just simply vanish, their bodies never found. And after the ancients have seen this happen time and time again, they decided that the tunnels under the territory are haunted, which is the main reason they decide to leave. Rock appears briefly, mostly to make Jaypaw question the existence of dead cats outside of StarClan. So we're just gonna get all of that past history done in one book instead of dragging it out for two whole series. Some of this stuff will come back though in Omen of the Stars, I swear. Trying to tie this whole ancient cat thing into the plot and have it mean something was a time. But I hope you like where I go with this. Anyway, 
After figuring out his place in the clan, the experience with Jay's wing makes Jay Paw question things again. If the cats who lived here before didn't belong here, does that mean he doesn't belong here either? Is that why he's seeing these things? What does it mean? He notices Firestar watching him and avoiding him at the same time. This will be Jay Paw's conflict throughout most of the book. In the middle of the book, Lionpaw and Hollypaw take their warrior assessment and Hollyleaf becomes a warrior while Lionpaw does not. This drives a wedge between Hollyleaf and her brothers. Hollyleaf believes her hard work and devoted following of the warrior code has gotten her where she is and she doesn't understand her brother's struggles to fit in. Hollypaw has empathy issues. After this, Lionpaw's meetings with Heatherpaw start to become less frequent on Heatherpaw's end. Lionpaw waits for her, but Heatherpaw only shows up occasionally. It seems she's having an easier time in WindClan now. She comes back one night and tells Lionpaw that she is now Heathertail. Lionpaw gets jealous and accuses Heathertail of being just like Hollyleaf, ready to abandon him when she gets what she wants. When he gets angry with her, Heathertail rips Lionpaw a new one, telling him that he's being a loser by moping around and not just choosing to be a better cat and that she's done with these nightly meetings. It's over between them. They continue shouting when Crowfeather hears them and goes into the tunnels and finds them. In his panic, Lionpaw attacks Crowfeather and severely wounds him. Heathertail calls Lionpaw a monster, and Lionpaw runs away after hearing more WindClan cats in the tunnels, including Breezepaw. After this, Lionpaw is at his low point. Haunted by the guilt of training in the dark forest, Heathertail's words, and his brutal attacks on Graystripe and Crowfeather, Lionpaw vows to become a better cat for real this time. He goes to the Dark Forest to tell Tigerstar and Hawkfrost that he won't train with them any longer. Tigerstar implies that they found other cats who will gladly take his place in training, and with his help, they found a way to get to them. Hawkfrost is betrayed to see Lionpaw leave. In many ways, Hawkfrost has been a better mentor than Ashfur, and it stings to leave that behind. Lionpaw finally starts to make a turnaround in ThunderClan. He's messed up his chances with the apprentices he grew up with. They've all become warriors now. But he makes an effort to help him befriend the younger apprentices who just got started, Foxpaw and Icepaw. Since he's not training in the Dark Forest anymore, he starts sleeping better and begins to realize that he was always grumpy with his clanmates, partly due to not getting enough sleep. And feels like a weight has been lifted from him since he isn't lying to them anymore either. His powers truly start to come to him at this time. Not that they've been missing before, but with this change of character comes a sort of upgrade, and this clues Lionpaw into the fact that he might, just maybe, be different from other cats. At the very end of the book, he gets to retry his warrior assessment and passes. During the epilogue of this book, Firestar gives Lionpaw his warrior name, Lionblaze. This is from Jay Paw's perspective, and he notices Firestar giving Hollyleaf and Lionblaze the same awkward, distant treatment that he's been feeling this whole time. Jay Paw can't take it anymore with Firestar's weirdness around himself and his siblings. Just as he's trying to figure out ways to confront his leader about it, Firestar calls Jay Paw into his den to speak with him privately. It's here that Firestar reveals the power of three prophecy to Jay Paw. But before he can get a reaction from j Paw or even a confirmation that Firestar knows that it's J. Holly and Lion, the book ends. Okay, hang on to your butts, because this is where we start tossing the rest of the books into the proverbial salad bowl. And like when I'm forced to eat a salad bowl, I'm just going to start picking and choosing what I want and leaving the rest behind like the garbage that it is. So, next up is Long Shadows. <laughs> yep, we're jumping right into the good stuff now. We start right where we left off. Firestar tells Jay Paw about the prophecy and that he's been watching Jay, Holly, and Lion and thinks that they are the cats the prophecy is talking about. At first, Jay Paw is relieved by this news. It means that he does really belong here in ThunderClan as a medicine cat, and not only that, but he's special. The powers he has mean something. Jay Paw is a bit bitter towards Firestar, though, for keeping this from him and his siblings, and is doubly pissed at his siblings for keeping whatever powers they might have away from him. After Jay Paw has a bit of time to cool off, Firestar talks to him again and apologizes, vowing to try and help Jay, Holly, and Lion the best he can. Jay Paw reluctantly agrees, and they fetch Hollyleaf and Lionblaze to tell them the truth as well. 
Firestar decides to start personally mentoring the three of them in order to help, though it has to remain a secret. With Firestar's mentorship, the three become closer again. j -Pot comes clean about his power to feel clanmates' emotions, and Lion Belays recalls his own awakening to his powers in the last book, though he still doesn't tell anyone about his training in the Dark Forest. And secretly is relieved that his powers didn't come from Tigerstar after all. Hollyleaf concludes that her power must have to do with leadership. As the readers, we know that she hasn't had any sort of awakening like J-Paw or Lionpaw, but Hollyleaf is confident that this must be it, so no one questions it. Firestar doesn't know what to make of these abilities, but he tells them to keep an eye out for messages from Star Clan. Overall, things seem to be looking up for them. A few more months goes by, Hollyleaf gets an apprentice, Rosepaw, and takes to her position as a mentor pretty quickly. It's still common to see Hollyleaf thinking about satisfying those ambitions she had back in book one. She still wants glory and recognition, and so far, despite her inner thoughts being a bit selfish and her compassion a bit questionable, especially after Hollyleaf catches Rosepaw breaking some minor warrior code rules, Hollyleaf seems like a good person overall, whose heart is in the right place at least. She's wise, genuine, and charismatic, if a bit strict. Lion Blaze is sure that his power is only good for hurting cats, so he stays away from conflict as much as possible. He begins reforming his relationships with the apprentices he had grown up with. Honeyfern, Mouse Whisker, and Hazeltail all forgive Lion Blaze pretty quickly, but Cinderheart and Poppy Frost take a little longer to come around, though they do eventually. Barry Nose and Lion Blaze never become real friends, so to speak, but they do form a healthy rivalry with each other that sort of doubles as a bit of an estranged bromance. J Paw gets his medicine cat named J Feather from Leaf Bull and starts getting dreams from Starkland filled with smoke, and he can't see in his dreams. He calls out to his family, but can never find them. J Feather tells Leaf Bull about these dreams, but she tries to insist that they're just nightmares. Jay Feather is convinced it's a warning from StarClan about something, but doesn't know what it could be. As a general note, uh, the way that Jay Feather communicates with StarClan is being completely scrapped. He still regains his sight whenever he dreams, but he can't dreamwalk. At least, not yet. And instead of StarClan chatting up Jay Feather like he's some roleplay ask blog, uh, StarClan actually kind of keeps Jayfeather at an arm's distance in their interactions. If anything, they come off as really desperate to keep Jayfeather under their thumb, but also are easily threatened by him. Jayfeather, though he is fairly clever, is still a young cat and pretty easily manipulated by them. Rock appears every now and then, but just as a mute, ghostly spirit. Whenever Jayfeather asks StarClan about him, they look horrified and confused. Jayfeather is sure that Rock has something to do with the ancient cats, but he's not sure what. Or how this could tie into the prophecy. After mentoring Jay, Holly, and Lion again, Firestar talks to Hollyleaf alone and expresses concerns for her brothers telling her to do her best to keep them on the straight and narrow. Firestar trusts Hollyleaf's power more than Lion Blazes and Jay Feathers to do good for ThunderClan, and overall feels a kinship with Hollyleaf due to her similar interests in helping clanmates and leading. Hollyleaf gives Rosepaw her warrior assessment, and Firestar is proud of Hollyleaf's skill at mentoring. So all that's well and good, but then the infamous fire scene happens. It's basically the same, but now we're going to do some good old-fashioned mentor death, because Firestar is going to get mortally wounded here trying to help his clanmates escape. Jayfeather, Hollyleaf, and Lionblaze stay back with Firestar, but Firestar eventually convinces them to escape before he dies. As a fun little bonus here for people paying attention, and a little foreshadowing, Hollyleaf nearly dies multiple times during this scene, but ends up narrowly escaping due to Lionblaze and Jayfeather's help. They get caught in the fire, and Squirrelflight jumps in to try and help, and Ashfur intervenes. Ashfur tries to get the three killed to hurt Squirrelflight, so she reveals the truth that Jay, Holly, and Lion aren't actually her kits. Ashfur says he doesn't care, this'll hurt Squirrelflight anyway. And that's when Jayfeather blurts out that Firestar is dead. This shocks both Ashfur and Squirrelflight, and the fight stops. Ashfur backs down saying, losing Firestar is only the beginning of his revenge on Squirrelflight. 
The book ends in much the same way, with the three freaking out over not knowing their biological parents, wondering how that affects the prophecy, and then Ashfur turning up dead by the end of the book. Firestar is also dead, so yeah, now we get Bramblestar. Yippee! At the end of this book, we get an epilogue with Leafpool, very similar to the prologue that begins Sunrise, with her finding the fur in Ashfur's claws and knowing who the true killer might be. Next book. With Long Shadows taking the spot of book three, we've hit the midpoint and we still have three books to go, so next up is Sunrise. In this book, I want to keep the kind of murder mystery meets absolute shitstorm of family drama vibe that the book was going for. So a lot of that stays the same, but again, we'll be moving some stuff around. Bramble Star is now, of course, the leader of ThunderClan, and the clan is in complete disarray after the deaths of Ashfur and Firestar. The clan wants answers and tensions are high. Squirrelflight is avoiding Jayfeather, Lionblaze, and Hollyleaf's bombardment of questions. She only tells them that she promised not to tell anyone about their real parents, but she wants them to know that she will always love them like her own. The three can't settle for this though, and each tries to find clues to the truth. During this book, Bramblestar will have to pick out a new deputy, and for the sake of this being my rewrite, it's going to be Sandstorm. Sandstorm is hesitant to take the position because she's still grieving Firestar, but she agrees. She's a good deputy, but everyone in the clan can tell that the cats closest to Firestar, like Sandstorm and Graystripe, are ready to retire to the Elder's Den. This is when Leafpool and Hollyleaf have their first confrontation. Leafpool tells Hollyleaf that she knows she killed Ashfur. After Leafpool promises not to tell anyone and keep Hollyleaf's secret, Hollyleaf questions Leafpool's motives, and Leafpool reveals the truth that she is her mother and Crowfeather is her father. Hollyleaf runs away from the scene, finding out that she is a half-clan, medicine cat-born kit shakes her down to her core. Jayfeather and Lionblaze notice Hollyleaf acting strangely, but she won't speak to them anymore. Then Honeyfern gets bitten by the snake, saving Briarkit, and Sandstorm gets injured while organizing warriors to plug up the holes in the camp to stop future snakes from getting inside. The clan has become super paranoid that StarClan is trying to send them a message by punishing them. Bramblestar is trying to find his place as the new leader of ThunderClan, but everything feels different. A part of ThunderClan died with Firestar, and ThunderClan cats are looking for something to fill that hole left behind. Before the next gathering, Leafpool is seen by Lionblaze coming out of Bramblestar's den, but when he asks her about this, again, she doesn't respond. Jayfeather is determined to figure out what all of this could mean for the prophecy. Did they all imagine it? Firestar seems so sure, but everything is different now. How could they have the power of the stars if everything turned out like this? And most importantly, who are their real parents? Then the gathering happens, and instead of Hollyleaf interrupting the gathering, Bramblestar calls her forward to speak. It turns out that Hollyleaf had told Bramblestar everything. From Ashfur's treachery, she might have blamed Firestar's death in the fire on him, to her heroic victory over him, to avenge their old leader, and, to her great shame, the truth about her heritage. And now, in an attempt to make things right with StarClan, Hollyleaf is telling all four clans. All hell breaks loose. Bramblestar confronts Squirrelflight and Leafpool right then and there. One star shames Crowfeather. Jayfeather and Lionblaze are horrified at everything taking place. Clouds cover the moon and end the gathering, but what's been done cannot be undone. When ThunderClan gets back to camp, Sandstorm chides Bramblestar on his rash behavior and treatment towards Squirrelflight. The clan begins to squabble about what should be done about Squirrelflight and Leafpool. Lionblaze stands between his clanmates and his mothers, furious and confused, but determined to not let anyone hurt them. Jayfeather rushes to Hollyleaf, urging her to try to fix this mess. Hollyleaf steps up and explains again why she did what she did. Ashfur was a traitor, and while what Squirrelflight and Leafpool did was a betrayal of their trust, Firestar wouldn't want to see his clanmates turn against his only children like this. Even though Hollyleaf is standing up for Leafpool and Squirrelflight, she also has a lot of contempt for them, and doesn't hide it very well. However, this is also the time where Hollyleaf chooses to reveal to ThunderClan 
that herself and her brothers are part of a prophecy from StarClan, and were being trained by Firestar to fulfill it. So ThunderClan should cut Leafpool and Squirrelflight some slack. So after Hollyleaf just drops all the bombshells, uh, Leafpool decides to resign as a medicine cat, Squirrelflight and Bramblestar get cat divorced, Sandstorm retires to the Elder's Den, and for the cherry on top, Bramblestar makes Hollyleaf his new deputy because she is, quote, the only cat willing to be honest with him. Ouch. Epilogue. New location, new character. We're near the sea where Midnight the Badger lives. A mysterious cat is talking to her, and he asks her where he can find the power of three. Midnight asks the mysterious cat what he would do with that information. She is not pleased that this intruder already knows too much. And Sol replies, I'm going to extinguish their power for good. Next book, Outcast. We're repurposing this title, and instead of it being a traveling book about the tribe of rushing water, it's now Soul's introductory book. Things are still a mess in ThunderClan, but a new normal is starting to take shape. Hollyleaf is an admirable deputy, even with her strict following of the code and people feeling a little mm, not sure about her. Many prefer Hollyleaf's temperament and maturity compared to Bramble Star, at least, who is still pretty emotional and brash after feeling betrayed by Squirrelflight and still coming to terms with leading in Firestar's shoes. He's not in a great mindset to be taking over the leadership role, to say the least. And I don't feel like this is out of character for Bramble Star either, because the dude does kind of tend to shut down in the middle of a crisis, especially ones that revolve around his own feelings. And while Hollyleaf might be getting along fairly well with the rest of the clan, Jayfeather and Lionblaze are less than thrilled with her. Both brothers feel just as betrayed by Hollyleaf as they do towards their mothers. They notice that the clan treats them differently, and take note how Hollyleaf positioned herself to get the least amount of backlash after everything was revealed, and left Jayfeather and Lionblaze to deal with everything after the fact. So while Hollyleaf is looked at as a hero, Jayfeather and Lionblaze are the unfortunate outcome of Codebreakers and dangerous cats in a prophecy. Jayfeather is struggling in the medicine den without Leafpool. More than anything, he wants her back, but he doesn't know how to process his feelings towards her either. Lionblaze has actually decided to talk to Leafpool and Squirrelflight about his feelings, and is the first cat to come to their defense when he overhears gossip. Lionblaze eventually forgives both of them, recalling his own arc with earning the forgiveness of his peers. In this rewrite, we are making Lionblaze an emotionally developed character, and he is going to thrive. This is the payoff for him being an absolute doofus at the beginning of the arc. And with this forgiveness, Lionblaze gains the resolve to use his power to protect those important to him. This will act as the power that gives Lionblaze his actual invulnerability. So in my head, before, he just had incredible strength, and he couldn't be beaten in battle, but he could be hurt. At this point, he gains the realization that so long as he is protecting those he loves, he also gains invulnerability. Reports surface about a new small group of cats lurking just outside clan territory. Shadow Clan saw them and was impressed enough by them to at least report it to Bramblestar. There's nothing to be done about it for now, though, so pretty soon our characters forget about it. During a half-moon meeting, the medicine cats get to the moon pool and find Soul there, seemingly after communing with Star Clan. They're shocked and angered that a stranger is using the pool. Soul takes special interest in Jayfeather as he explains to the medicine cats that there are portals one can take to speak to the dead, and he's on a pilgrimage to find them. He describes a few of these portals, Mothwing and Little Cloud recognize him describing the Moonstone, and Jayfeather recognizes the description of the Cave of Pointed Stones from his dreams about the Tribe of Rushing Water. Sol also mentions Sky Clan's Whispering Cave and a dark tunnel that leads to an equally dark forest, but none of the cats present know what he means by those. Sol also mentions that the Moonstone is a dead portal. Abandoned and forsaken, it leads absolutely nowhere now. He wonders aloud, coolly, but threateningly, if perhaps the same fate will happen to this portal. 
The medicine cats become unsettled and demand Soul leave. Still cool and unbothered, Soul leaves, but Jayfeather feels like he's being watched on his whole journey back to ThunderClan. Soul showing up at the moon pool rattles the clan leaders. Blackstar appears in ThunderClan and tells Bramblestar that he plans on giving Little Cloud a permanent bodyguard for the time being, and encourages Jayfeather to have one as well. Bramblestar and Hollyleaf assign Lion Blaze to a very begrudging Jayfeather. At the next gathering, they learn that One Star has started sending his warriors to patrol the moon pool to make sure that the intruder doesn't go near it again. This angers the other leaders, fearing that Wind Clan is making a claim to the territory. Like usual, the clans are bickering amongst themselves. Hollyleaf breaks up the argument and reasons with the other leaders that for the time being, keeping the moon pool safe from this intruder is more important. So Wind Clan should be allowed to continue patrolling the place, but not marking it as their own territory. ThunderClan will also send warriors to do the occasional patrol to make sure that the stranger is no longer trespassing. As the book progresses, rumors spread about Sol. Sometimes he's seen with other cats following him around. Sometimes he's alone. Some rumors talk about small miracles he's performed in front of witnesses, and some start blaming Sol for their bad luck while hunting, sure that the strange cat has placed some kind of curse on them. The mysticism around Sol particularly bothers Jayfeather. After all, he's supposed to be the cat with the powers, so what good are his abilities next to a cat like Sol? So, one night after Lion Blaze falls asleep, Jayfeather sneaks out of ThunderClan camp and heads towards the moon pool to try and find Sol. He knows Lion Blaze and Hollyleaf wouldn't approve, and he think and he doesn't think that Sol has any good intentions for him, but if he's really supposed to be a powerful special prophecy cat, then he should be able to survive whatever Sol can do. Maybe Sol can help him figure out the mystery behind Rock. After looking for most of the night, Jayfeather finally finds Sol. Or rather, Sol finds Jayfeather. Jayfeather doesn't reveal his involvement in any prophecy, but says that he wants Sol to teach him what he knows so that he can become a better medicine cat. Sol agrees and they decide on when and where next to meet. Near the ShadowClan border, where there aren't as many patrols around the moon pool. So now we have Jayfeather training with Sol, Lionblaze playing as bodyguard, and Hollyleaf as deputy of ThunderClan. Things continue like this until one night Lion Blaze notices Jayfeather is missing. Unsure of what to do, Lion Blaze goes to Hollyleaf and the two follow Jayfeather's trail until it leads them to Sol. At first they just watch, but other cats surround Lion Blaze and Hollyleaf and announce their presence to Sol. Now Sol has all three cats right here. This is what he's been waiting for. He reveals that he knows about the prophecy and wants to prepare them for their destiny. Lion Blaze immediately rejects Sol's offer. He's heard this lie from Tigerstar. Hollyleaf and Jayfeather are taken in by Sol, though Hollyleaf rejects Sol and chastises Jayfeather for his recklessness. Jayfeather spits back that Hollyleaf has been the reckless one lately, and that he plans to continue training with Sol no matter what they say. Hollyleaf reasons that she'll come train with Sol, but only to make sure that her little brother is safe. Sure, Hollyleaf. So behind the scenes of all of this soul training, the clans are getting extremely antsy and protective of the moon pool and its surrounding territory. Even Shadow Clan and River Clan cats have started showing up around the moon pool, and it's led to a number of fights both around the moon pool and on other territories, as River Clan and Shadow Clan warriors pass through Wind Clan and Thunder Clan territory. As a new leader, Bramblestar tries to assert his authority by telling ShadowClan cats that they can't just walk through ThunderClan anytime they want. The path around the lake is only supposed to be used in emergencies, and WindClan is guarding the moon pool from strangers, but Blackstar refuses to listen. And lo and behold, since traveling to the moon pool takes a good chunk of time and energy, warriors patrolling the moon pool have also been caught hunting, and this has only added to the tensions of all four clans and added another layer of confusion when warriors pass through smelling like prey or carrying it. At the next gathering, an enraged One Star claims that moon pool territory belongs to Wind Clan. It is the closest to them and technically has always been a part of their territory. The other clans must not trespass again or they will be attacked. No one likes this. 
Misty Star doubts Wind Clan's ability to protect it sufficiently enough, and Black Star wonders aloud how long before Wind Clan decides to cut the other three clans away from Star Clan altogether without getting something from it. Bramble Star agrees with Misty Star and Black Star, but adds that he doesn't want River Clan and Shadow Clan passing through Thunder Clan on a daily basis to patrol the Moon Pool. The other leaders accuse Thunder Clan of trying to dictate to the other clans. Before things get too out of hand, the Medicine Cats speak up. They say that this whole situation has gotten out of hand, and this is not what their warrior ancestors would want. Blood should not be shed at a place as sacred as the Moon Pool. They should go back to the way things were and deal with Soul if it becomes a problem, not before. The Medicine Cats also bemoan having warrior bodyguards around all the time, but agree to let a few warriors accompany them to the Half Moon meetings if their leaders feel it's necessary. Reluctantly, the leaders agree to this arrangement, but it's pretty clear that none of them actually plan on following through with it. Everyone goes home, and individually, Hollyleaf, Jayfeather, and Lionblaze decide to take the situation into their own paws and do something about all this. Lionblaze decides to use the tunnels to check and see if WindClan is keeping their promise. Jayfeather decides to try and go ask StarClan for advice, and he gets Kestrel Flight and Willowshine to come with him. And Hollyleaf decides to go find Soul. They all have middling success. Down in the tunnels, Lionblaze quickly overhears that Wind Clan plans to continue their claim on Moonpool territory, other clan leaders be damned. Jay Feather goes to the Moonpool, but Star Clan won't speak to him, and with a bit of dread, he realizes that he hasn't been able to talk with Star Clan since he started training with Soul. Jay Feather is determined to find a way to them, however, and this is how he awakens his dreamwalking ability. He walks into Kestrel Flight's dream and tracks down StarClan cats himself. StarClan is angry and afraid of Jayfeather and his siblings' powers, and decided to cut off access to him altogether. Though now that he can dreamwalk, they are realizing that Jayfeather is a force to be reckoned with that they can't just ignore. When Hollyleaf finds Soul and it's just the two of them alone, Hollyleaf demands that Soul tell her his plans. Soul tells Hollyleaf his backstory that he grew up as a kitty pet near Sky Clan territory, but he always felt like he had a bigger purpose, a higher calling. He left his kitty pet life to join Sky Clan, and here's where we're changing more of Soul's backstory. He felt called to be a medicine cat and commune with the warrior ancestors. Soul trained at first as a warrior, but continued yearning to train as a medicine cat. When he finally did start to train, he was a natural at it. He understood Star Clan's messages better than any other medicine cat, and soon Sky Clan was looking to Soul as their spiritual guide. Eventually, Soul was good enough at seeing omens and prophecies that he started to make ones up that, in his mind, would help the clan towards a better future. And finding clever ways to stop other omens from Star Clan from coming true. This angered Star Clan, and eventually Sky Clan's leader Leaf Star finally caught on to what he was doing. Before being banished, Soul attempted to destroy Sky Clan's other means of communicating with Star Clan so that they would depend on him, but Sky Clan warriors stopped him. Soul insists that the clan's dependency on Star Clan was more harmful than helpful. Star Clan would send prophecies that they knew nothing about, or to push forward their own goals, or and he would emphasize this one particularly to Hollyleaf, encourage cats to break the warrior code. They were much better off without their ancestors, cats who were just as foolish dead as they were alive, and of course, listening to Soul's own wisdom instead. Hollyleaf gets taken in by this, not right away, but she does see the reason in this. She asks if that's Soul's real mission, to remove Star Clan and put Capable she thinks of herself and her brothers, cats in charge of the clans. Soul laughs and says, Yes, of course. You have the power of the stars, after all. What else would I want? Hollyleaf's obvious villain red flag alert isn't working too well, so she agrees that maybe Soul's plan wouldn't be so bad. <sighs> okay, I know this is a long one, but I've had to make up most of this book's material from scratch, but we finally reached the climax. 
Lion Blaze rushes back to ThunderClan camp to tell Bramblestar the news about WindClan. Hollyleaf and Jayfeather are still missing. Where are ThunderClan's deputy and Medicine Cat? Uh-oh, the tension is at a boiling over point. Bramblestar is enraged by this news and plans to send a group of warriors to the Moon Pool to get the message through to WindClan that the territory around the Moon Pool does not belong to them. Squirrelflight and Leafbolt protest, telling Bramblestar that this will only escalate things. He doesn't listen, because of course he doesn't. And of course, ThunderClan no sooner than gets to the Moon Pool when WindClan also arrives. They fight, and Jayfeather wakes up from his communion with StarClan. Kestrelflight waking up kicked him out of StarClan, and the three young medicine cats hear the battle going on down the hill. The fighting stops when Bramblestar and One Star face off. One Star loses a life, and when he comes back, he wakes up terrified. Star Clan has warned him of the power of three prophecy and that Jayfeather, Lionblaze, and Hollyleaf will destroy Star Clan. Star Clan has turned their backs on our protagonists and proclaimed them as a threat to the clan's very way of life. Epilogue Soul and Hollyleaf team up and make their way into Shadow Clan territory. Soul has been communicating with Shadow Clan and creating omens that point towards a rough season for Shadow Clan. Soul tells Hollyleaf that they're going to stop Shadow Clan from destroying themselves in the fight over the moon pool. Hollyleaf and Soul are going to strike a deal with Shadow Clan and prove their power. Okay, I know things are getting a little crazy now, but stick with me. We're finally at the last book, Eclipse. Okay, so now we have Hollyleaf and Soul working together as a dynamic evil duo bent on stopping the clans from listening to Star Clan. Star Clan has turned their backs on our protagonists, and things are bad. So, after the battle at the Moon Pool, Thunder Clan isn't sure what to do with the three. Bramble Star is also in critical condition from his fight with One Star and needs Jayfeather's aid. But the cats who were at the battle and heard One Star's message from Star Clan are extremely wary of Jayfeather and Lion Blaze. Bramble Star is unconscious. Jayfeather calls Leafpool back into the medicine den to help him with Bramble Star. They get Bramble Star stable, but he's still unable to speak and essentially in a coma for now. He hasn't died yet but he can't talk to them. Jayfeather and Lionblaze go out to address the clan's concerns. Hollyleaf still hasn't returned, which frightens them, but Jayfeather promises that he and his siblings aren't trying to destroy Star Clan. He has a medicine cap for Star Clan's sake. This doesn't really help, but it at least cools things down for the time being. Everyone recognizes that Lionblaze's skill in combat helped them win at the moon pool, and Bramble Star needs Jayfeather's help, so for the time being, they kind of have to trust them. But where's their deputy? Where's Hollyleaf? Hollyleaf returns the next day. She ignores most questions thrown at her about where she's been and takes over as acting leader in Bramble Star's absence. No one knows how long Bramble Star will be out, so Hollyleaf makes Lion Blaze her acting deputy. Now the three are in charge of the whole clan, and cats are really starting to feel uncomfortable with all this. Patrols around the moon pool haven't stopped. Wind Clan has laid an even stronger claim around the territory. Hollyleaf says that they'll wait for Bramble Star to regain consciousness before acting, though secretly she's fine with letting Wind Clan waste their time with it. After all, they don't need the moon pool anymore. And as you can probably imagine with this setup, Evil Hollyleaf is pretty thoroughly put in place here. I want to really have a lot of time to explore her breakdown and self-righteousness throughout the back half of the arc. Her mental state will have been deteriorating since the murder of Ashfur and the reveal of her real parents. And her bitterness towards her clanmates, Leafpool, Crowfeather, and StarClan will steadily grow. Hollyleaf is going to be clinging to her power here for as long as possible before the inevitable drop. She's been visiting Bramble Star and using her previous medicine cat training knowledge to secretly poison him, keeping him in bad condition and unable to lead. This will also serve as a setup for her using death berries. She's also, like I mentioned before, working with Soul. Jayfeather has turned away from Soul and is led to believe that Hollyleaf has too. Jayfeather knows Soul isn't the key to unlocking their powers anymore, and they don't need him to fulfill the prophecy. Plus, Jayfeather is majorly freaking out about Starkland turning their backs on him. 
Jay Feather's powers also tell him that Holly Leaf is hiding stuff from him, but he can't coax it out of her. Lion Blaze hates being Holly Leaf's deputy, but he stays because he thinks it's the best way to keep an eye on her, who he's beginning to suspect the worst from. He tries to talk about this with Jay Feather, but Jay Feather won't listen to Lion Blaze. Despite Jay Feather's prickly exterior, he can't believe something like that of his sister, so Lion Blaze works alone in monitoring Holly Leaf. Holly Leaf's onto him, though, and much more clever. She keeps Lion Blaze busy when she goes to meet Soul, and manages to keep Lion Blaze in the dark about as much as possible. Only a day or two has passed, and an impromptu gathering is called. Blackstar announces that they've decided to stop following Star Clan and start following Soul's wisdom instead. He's proved through his prophecies that he's more reliable than Star Clan, which is impossible to reach anyhow because of Wind Clan's intense border marking. Misty Star and One Star are shocked by this news, but Hollyleaf congratulates Black Star's decision. Maybe all the clan should look for an alternative method of receiving prophecies since the Moon Pool is guarded by Wind Clan. One Star stutters and says that Wind Clan was guarding it for the sake of all the clans, not to keep it away from them. Sol also makes an appearance at the gathering and decides to give the clans his own prophecy. Star Clan will abandon them when Sol makes the sun disappear from the sky and the moon pool will be destroyed. Only Sol, and he'll look to Hollyleaf, certain other cats with a greater wisdom than Star Clan will guide the clans after that. Shadow Clan goes home after all of this, and the other clans sit in shock, panicking about Soul's message. How could the moon pool be destroyed? Soul surely can't make the sun disappear, can he? Should they attack Shadow Clan and drive Soul away? Would that stop all this from happening? The clans return home without any answers. As days grow closer to Soul's prophecy, the wheels start coming off the cart. One Star and Misty Star announce that they plan on joining forces to protect the Moon Pool and ask ThunderClan to join them. Hollyleaf aligns ThunderClan completely with Soul and ShadowClan. When Hollyleaf finally declares her alliance with Soul, Lion Blaze has had enough. He gets together with Cinderheart, Foxleaf, Ice Cloud, and Berry Nose, and together the group decides that they've got to find a way to stop Hollyleaf. Squirrelflight overhears these plans and also joins her son's rebellion. Lion Blaze tells them about the tunnels beneath ThunderClan and WindClan that they can use to travel discreetly to talk to the other leaders. While down in the tunnels, Lion Blaze and the others notice unfamiliar cat scent. Someone else has been down there, though they do smell faintly of Sol. Unknown to them, Sol has been putting the other cats with him down to work in the tunnels. Before Jayfeather stopped training with him, Jayfeather revealed the location of the tunnels when he tried asking Sol about Rock. He found out that the tunnels go below the moon pool and plans to dig beneath it to destroy the pool and dry it up. Soul's followers are willing to put themselves in harm's way to accomplish this mission. So, on the day of the eclipse, the clans are ready for all-out war, much like in the original book Eclipse. The other clans are ready to fight Shadow Clan to get to Soul, and Shadow Clan is going to defend what they believe is their new way of life without warrior ancestors. Before ThunderClan is forced to join ShadowClan's forces, Jayfeather and Leafpool catch Hollyleaf in the medicine den poisoning Bramblestar. Jayfeather is heartbroken. How could you do this, Hollyleaf? How could you do this to our father? Bramblestar's condition has worsened from all the poisonings, and before Hollyleaf can fully grasp what she's done, Bramblestar loses a life to the poison. She meant to keep him unstable, not kill him. Jayfeather rushes to Bramble Star, and Leafpool confronts Hollyleaf with tears in her eyes. Hollyleaf lets out all her anger with Leafpool in that moment. She hates being half clan. Her existence goes against the code, and she killed Ashford to try and hide it, but it's done nothing but bring her more misery. She hates Leafpool for doing this to her. They have their iconic Deathberry confrontation, and Hollyleaf bolts. That's it, I can't do this anymore, she screams. Jayfeather feels the despair from Hollyleaf, stronger than ever, like a tidal wave of emotions that has been locked up and waiting to burst. Hollyleaf, no, come back! Jayfeather can't stop her, though. Bramblestar wheezes back to life, his new life from StarClan healing the poison of his previous wounds. Once he gets a moment to collect himself, 
Leafpool and Jayfeather try their best to fill him in, but don't have much time to explain. ThunderClan can turn the tide of this fight if they join with RiverClan and WindClan and stop Soul. Bramblestar gets to work. Warriors of all clans are meeting at the ThunderClan border of WindClan. Misty Star and One Star agreed to rally there and attack ShadowClan and ThunderClan until they give up Soul. Bramble Star has a short amount of time to stop ThunderClan from fighting on the wrong side. As Bramble Star gets there, the sun gets covered by the moon and the eclipse begins. The sun disappearing causes the clans to panic and the fighting begins. No one really sure what side they are fighting on anymore or what this will accomplish. Lion Blaze and his team sit in the tunnels. They figured out Soul's plan to drain the moon pool from below and plan to sneak attack any unknown cats they find down there to protect the moon pool until the sun comes back and Soul is proven wrong. They do catch Soul's accomplices just in time and drag them out of the tunnels, only to be shocked when Hollyleaf rushes by them and darts into the tunnels herself. With a gasp of horror, Squirrelflight dives into the tunnels after Hollyleaf, but it's too late. Hollyleaf finishes Soul's work and the tunnels collapse under the weight of the water above and on top of Hollyleaf. Squirrelflight barely makes it out in time so as not to get washed away. Hollyleaf is gone now and Soul's plan has worked. The moon pool is destroyed and this stops the clan's fighting. Jayfeather has rushed onto the scene now and a sorrowful lion blaze fills him in on what Hollyleaf has done. The clan cats panic. What are the clans going to do without the moon pool? How do they talk to Star Clan now? Suddenly, Jayfeather gets an idea. He jumps onto the collapsed pool and begins digging. Thinking that Jayfeather is grieving for Hollyleaf, Lion Blaze tries to stop him, but Jayfeather says that he might be able to save Star Clan. Lion Blaze helps him dig. Bramble Star, Squirrel Flight, Crowfeather, and other clan cats begin helping. Cats from all four clans. The soil is damp and muddy, but they keep digging together. When they reach the tunnels again, Jayfeather notes that they haven't found Hollyleaf's body. He shudders at the thought, but thinks this might be a good sign. Jayfeather and Lionblaze go into the tunnels to search, insisting that they need to do this alone. Bramblestar allows it and stops the other cats there from protesting. Jayfeather fills Lionblaze in on his plan. When he first met Sol, Sol mentioned that there was a portal to the afterlife inside dark tunnels that lead to a dark forest. Jayfeather thinks he can use his dreamwalking ability to find StarClan from there. Lionblaze timidly confesses that he knows what the Dark Forest is, and he doesn't think they're going to find any StarClan cats there. We have to try. We have the power of the stars in our paws, so we have to do this. What about Hollyleaf? They can't bear to think about it. I don't know. What about the prophecy? We can't think about that now. When the brothers feel that they've been walking into the tunnels forever and everything has gotten much too dark to see, Jayfeather smells something. Something that smells like decay and blood. Lion Blaze can soon see the familiar trees of the dark forest. They've made it. But now what do they do? They hear rustling. Lion Blaze is worried it might be Tiger Star. Instead, Hollyleaf appears. Hollyleaf, Lion Blaze growls. Jayfeather can hear the anger and hurt in Lion Blaze's voice, and without warning, Jayfeather feels himself get pushed behind Lion Blaze's large body. Jayfeather is always quicker than his brother anticipates, and he darts around Lion Blaze. Now that they are in this world for cats that are no longer living, Jayfeather's dream walking sight is beginning to come to him, but something isn't right. The edges of Jayfeather's sight are blurry, and he can only make out Hollyleaf's silhouette. But it is undeniably her. Jayfeather can still smell his sister's earthly scent, feel her ebbing push and pull of emotions like a wave. Hollyleaf. Jayfeather's voice is a crack. As much as he's happy to be reunited with both of his siblings, the way it should be, he thinks. Jayfeather also feels white hot anger. Hollyleaf, what have you done? How did you both get here? is her only reply. Jayfeather can feel Lion Blaze's hackles fall behind him. Thankfully, this won't turn into a fight. Jayfeather got us here. Hollyleaf, do you know where you are? What you've done? I've made a horrible mistake. I'm in the dark forest, aren't I? Where's Star Clan? Hollyleaf's voice trembled. 
You destroyed the moon pool, Holly Leaf. Jay Feather couldn't help himself. What do you think was going to happen? And for what? Is this what you wanted? Is this what the prophecy was for? Holly Leaf and Lion Blaze were silent. Jay Feather could feel their eyes on him. Then a new emotion came from Holly Leaf, clear as day. Shame. Jay Feather, I thought you were the clever one, but maybe not. What do you mean? I'm not part of the prophecy. Never was. This, of all things, should prove it. I was never powerful like you and Lion Blaze. The shock of this revelation made them stop. Then Lion Blaze shook himself and stepped forward. That's ridiculous. You just destroyed the moon pool. You've been outsmarting my every move to track you and Soul for the last several days. You're one of the most powerful and capable cats I know, Holly Leaf. Holly Leaf chuckled wistfully. Well, that's true. But I don't have any powers. Never did. The way you and Jay Feather came here of your own free will? That's something I could never do. I tried to fool myself into thinking that the prophecy was about me. Trying to force myself into the prophecy. Make it come true. I thought, if I could bring down Starkland with Soul, then the prophecy had to be about me. But it just made me Soul's lackey. And got me here. Jay Feather shook his head. But that doesn't make any sense. We're the kin of Firestar's kin. Who else could the third cat be? I don't know, Holly Leaf sighed sadly. <sighs> but it isn't me. Jay Feather was stunned and angry and sad. That's not fair. He could feel Holly Leaf's worries, fears of being excluded from her brother's big destiny. All of these emotions that Holly Leaf had been keeping a tight hold on for so long. He wonders if Holly Leaf is only now feeling them herself. Come back with us, Holly Leaf. We have to find Star Clan. We can figure it out with your help. You can still fix this. Holly Leaf laughed. A sad, loud laugh. You still don't get it, Jay Feather. I can't do anything. Not anymore. I'm dead. The truth that Jay Feather was avoiding hit him like a stone. Holly Leaf. Lion Blaze's gruff voice was serious. He lowered his head. This place that you're in, the dark forest, it's... I know. She cut him off. But I've made my nest, so now I have to sleep in it. The siblings became quiet. What was there to say to something like that? Holly Leaf shook out her fur and then rushed both of her brothers and purred as she rubbed her head against them. You have to go. You won't find Star Clan here. And now you've shown me the portal to the world of living cats. I'm afraid what will happen if the Dark Forest cats find it. My atonement starts now. I'll protect this portal for as long as I can. They parted, and after a heartbreaking moment of silence, Lion Blaze added, You won't do it alone. Jay Feather realized his brother's intentions, but couldn't stop himself from shouting, What? He looked desperately between his siblings. No. No, no, no. I can't lose both of you in the same day. Lion Blaze touched his head to Jay Feather. Jay Feather could feel his brother's resolve, strong as a rock, though regret and sadness also weighed heavily on him. Nothing Jay Feather would say could change his mind. I have to. Lion Blaze stated, I have my power for a reason. I'll stay here with Holly Leaf and we'll protect the portal together. You have to go back, Jay Feather. Find the third cat of the prophecy and figure out how to reach Star Clan again. I know you can do it. Rage filled Jay Feather. Why do I have to do everything myself? This, this isn't fair. He paused and let himself sigh to try and ground himself. Fine, you big Stupid furballs, I'll do it. You won't be trapped here forever, I promise. I'm going to get both of you out of here. Jay Feather, Holly Leaf mewed with shock. The three siblings curled around each other again. This was goodbye. Jay Feather didn't know when he'd see them again, but he would see them again, both of them. We believe in you, Jay Feather. Lion Blaze bumped his head with Jay Feather one last time. We'll see you soon. Yeah. 
Jay Feather nodded with determination. See you soon. Epilogue! A few weeks have gone by and the clans are returning to a new normal. Bramblestar is leading ThunderClan once more, Squirrelflight is his new deputy, and while everyone still stares sadly up at Silverpelt when they think of their lost communication with StarClan, the clans are getting by. Soul has vanished. His followers have been chased off, but there's been no sightings of the mysterious Tom since Eclipse. Blackstar was desperate to find him at first, but the hunt proved fruitless. Jayfeather has been determined to think of a way to get StarClan back, but hasn't come to any conclusions yet. He has, however, noticed that Whitewing and Cloudtail's kits, Ivy Kit and Dove Kit, are just about to become apprentices, and he can't help but wonder if one of them could be the third cat of the prophecy that they've been missing this whole time. Dun dun da! The end! Oh, okay. <laughs> so that's my take on the power of three. We end with Jay Feather alone in ThunderClan, Hollyleaf dead, and Lion Blaze in the Dark Forest with Hollyleaf. It's a gut punch of an ending, but that's what Sunrise was too when it first came out, and everything is as up in the air as before. I think the biggest changes I made were Firestar's early death and then everything that has to do with Soul. I hope that with just these additions, it helps raise the stakes properly, and I hope you agree. Another big change, of course, is the ending with Lion Blaze choosing to stay behind in the Dark Forest. This gives Lion Blaze and his powers something more meaningful to be doing in Omen of the Stars, because unfortunately, he just doesn't really have anywhere to grow in that arc. It also feels like a task suitable to his power. When Lion Blaze is fighting other clan cats, it really doesn't hold any suspense because you know that Lion Blaze is invincible and the best fighter ever. So having him stay in the Dark Forest gives him some actual stakes. Is he going to be able to guard the portal? Is he invincible to an army of dead cats? How are he and Hollyleaf gonna manage? Can he protect the clans while also keeping Hollyleaf's spirit safe? It just seems like a good place to leave Lion Blaze at the moment. And dear Lord, I literally brainstormed for months on how exactly I would fit all the weird loose ends from this arc in here, like Rock and the Ancients and the important character deaths and Soul and try and get the Dark Forest invasion foreshadowing in, but I know I missed some stuff. So here's a rapid fire of other things that should probably happen at some point in these books, but I didn't feel like mentioning them in my grand summary of things. Stormfur and Brook. They return to the tribe. Just, I don't know, they go back. Bye, and Purdy joins ThunderClan. Welcome back, you silly old man. Not important, but you know, I figured I'd tie up that loose end. Breeze Pelt. He hates Crowfeather for nearly killing Crowfeather in the tunnels, and he swears vengeance. Crowfeather disowns Jay Feather, Lion Blaze, and Hollyleaf when the truth comes out, just like in the books, and Bree's heart takes this as further justification that he needs revenge on all three of them, not just Lion Blaze now. When one star dies in the fight against Bramble Star and hears the prophecy, Breeze Pelt then goes to full, I need revenge on all of ThunderClan, especially Jay Feather, Hollyleaf, and Lion Blaze. This gives Breeze Pelt a bit more of a gradual ratification and doesn't just make his main problem daddy issues, though he still definitely has that going on for him. Donnie Pelt still has her litter of kits, Tiger Kit, Flame Kit, and Dawn Kit, probably sometime an outcast, and she asks for Bramble Star's aid when Black Star lines with Soul. But when she finds out that Bramble Star is in critical condition, she returns to Shadow Clan. I love the idea of Lion Blaze covertly working with them like the three do in the books, so maybe he tries to have them help spy on Hollyleaf. Fallen Leaves has not been yeeted from the story entirely, but he is one of the cats that Jay's wing saw go into the tunnels and never come out. I'll come back to this in my Omen of the Stars rewrite. Cinderheart is just going to live her normal warrior life. Maybe sometimes she has memories of Cinderpelt's life, but that's going to be as far as it goes. She's just living a good life, and I'm not touching the whole Cinderpelt possession thing with a 10-foot pole. And I think that's mostly it. That's my rewrite of The Power of Three. 
I know that without knowing how I'd rewrite Omen of the Stars, you can't really get the full picture yet, but I hope that this was still a fun time. I can't promise that the Omen of the Stars video will be soon because it takes a long time for me to write this stuff and I like spending a long time brainstorming everything, but it is coming eventually. I ask that you please be patient as I work on some other things as a palette cleanser first. And again, I want to thank everyone for subscribing and enjoying my content. Your support means a lot and I'm so happy that I get to make videos like this. I probably should have said this at the beginning of the video, but this video is replacing drawing a blank for this week. And based on how long this has taken me to record this, we'll probably replace drawing a blank for the next few weeks because yeah, this, this is a really, really long video. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh my god. I'm so sorry to me who's going to have to edit all this. Anyway, I've taken up enough of your time. Thank you all. Let me know what you thought about this rewrite. I'm really eager to know. I've been working on this for forever. Um, but have a wonderful day and remember to please stay inspired.